Welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast, episode 42. Dementia is not a cure crisis, it's a care crisis, with Dr. Noel Collins. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. Here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast. If you're new here, a very warm welcome to the show. And if you've listened to the podcast before, you may have heard a couple of episodes on the topic of dementia. The reason we've covered the subject on a few occasions before is that it's one of those classic 3 a.m. moments our retirement planning clients experience. Now, when I say 3 a.m. moments, I mean one of those concerns that causes us to wake up in the middle of the night and, and worry. And now for that reason, I'm delighted to be joined this week by another dementia expert, Dr. Noel Collins. Now, Dr. Collins is an older adult psychiatrist whose work relates to diagnosing memory problems and delivering appropriate treatment for patients with dementia. Dr. Collins is joining us all the way from Western Australia today. So thank you for joining me, Dr. Collins. It's a pleasure. So just give a little frame of reference, Dr. Collins. Could you just tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, yep, I'm, I'm originally from Western Australia and completed my medical degree here and then through, through life ended up training in London and completed my psychiatric uh, training there and was working as a older adult psychiatrist in Surrey and as part of that work uh, I would attend a, a memory clinic with, with Mary Jordan who was working in the Alzheimer's Society and we literally sat together for a number of uh, years in a very small room, seeing probably hundreds of people presenting with memory problems, some of which would be classified as dementia. Um, but what happened about uh, two years in is, despite having excellent training um, around the medical side of dementia, I, I, I found that was somewhat limiting. So I decided to study gerontology at King's College University. And gerontology is the study of, of, of ageing, the sociology of ageing. And what's very interesting about that is we always think about ageing as being a purely biological process, developing wrinkles and, uh, you know, legs giving way. But actually, as we age, we're, we're influenced by many non-biological things. You know, we're very um, influenced by social policy, by the law, by finances. Um, and that also includes uh, dementia. And so looking through um, dementia with a more sociological lens, a non-medical lens, um, I actually find that more useful. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in an interesting position because I, 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 I am a doctor, but um, I, and I think it's it's very helpful because, as you say, people presenting with memory problems are very fearful of dementia. Um, but uh, I think dementia occupies occupies a place that cancer did probably 50 years ago. That there's a lot of fear around the word, and that's why the book was called the D word. Yeah, yeah, sure. And one of the things I pick up on there that I'm sure people are confused by. If you present yourself with a memory problem, I mean, you first of all, I can imagine that you don't really want to be, have this label of dementia. And second of all, well, you know, I can struggle to find my keys and my wallet and my phone and <laughs> and, and and such like, you know, um, and forget things, um, birthdays, etc. Um, you know, so at what point? Do we kind of go, do you know what, we need some help here or what, or present ourselves to someone, an expert like you to go, you know, what's happening to me here? Is that just, is this just normal or is this just, you know, is this dementia, you know? Um, and then could the label possibly be given at the wrong time? Uh, well, yes, to all of that. People who worry about their memory do have dementia in their minds, but forgetting where your keys are or having a lapse of memory, that's a normal experience. Yeah. But uh one, one thing that's been, I think, a, a great development in the UK is, is the memory clinic model. So a lot of the questions that you just asked, uh, a lot of people who were referred to the memory clinic by their GP with a concern about their memory would ask. Uh, but what surprises many people about dementia is there's no such thing as a dementia test. Um, you know, it's 2019. We think there should be a special blood test or a special uh, scan of the head that tells us that you know, there's dementia or there isn't. But what people don't realise is that dementia remains a clinical diagnosis. 
Um, and we have to demonstrate that people's memory plus other brain functions are declining over time to a degree that impacts on their day-to-day -day function um, and that that, that uh, functional decline is not accounted for by something else like a depression or another medical problem. So it can be a tricksy uh, diagnosis. It sounds like quite a simple thing to diagnose, but, um, but it isn't, um, particularly when there's a context of fear and worry. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And then and uh, uh, you can imagine, what, you know, the idea that you've suddenly got to go back into the world going, mm, I've been diagnosed with dementia is a pretty mm -hmm. scary, um, a pretty scary place to be. Uh, you, you, you must um, tell me how you handle that. Well, this is one of the, the, the benefits, I think, of looking at dementia a bit more broadly, is that if you pick up a newspaper, that includes dementia in the title. It's normally about it being this terrible epidemic of Alzheimer's and all those headlines uh, headlines about nursing home abuse. But actually, you know, a hundred years ago, statistically, neither of us would have been alive to have this conversation because the likelihood would be that we'd be knocked off by an infectious disease or something else. Yeah. So the biggest risk factor for dementia is age. And so naturally, as um, our society ages and that life expectancy increases, um, the prevalence of dementia um, rises. So this is probably the catch in us living longer. Um, and we don't quite know how long our brains um, are supposed to live for. Um, so what's often helpful straight away is saying to people who are presenting with a memory problem or a dementia is to say, well, actually, you've done a pretty good job. You know, you, you know, the, the average uh, life expectancy in Surrey where I was living was was about 83, 84 for women and a few years less for men. And I'd often see people who were in their sort of mid or late 80s that were terribly concerned about things. But I'd say, well, look, you're a, you're an A star person. You've lived a very long life. Um, there's and, and part of the catch is a memory problem or potentially dementia. But if we think about that, that is not a threat to you as a person and that many people with dementia can live very, very happy, very fulfilling lives. Yeah, yeah, that's really that's really interesting to obviously to frame it in the basis of actually, you know, you've done well to get there. And therefore, just by the I suppose, by, just by the, the, the luck of living longer or in a, in, a, in, a, in a better medical world and a better health world that that some things are going to get you and of course we replace lots of stuff now don't we? We, we, we people have new hips and new knees and heart transplants and all types of stuff well you know the, 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 we haven't got to the point of being able to replace our brains i don't think yet not yet not thankfully yet. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know sometimes i i wonder whether i can do with some extra brain cells but uh, <laughs> Now, I suppose for people who, you know, the, the, the book, your, your book covers, you know, people uh, who've, 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 how we care for people with dementia. And, but what is there, is there anything we can do to prevent it? Uh, well, I think the key is activity. And I think most people interpret that in terms of intellectual activity. So I'd have a lot of people who would come to the memory clinic saying, well, you know, I've got mums starting to do Sudoku and crosswords and, 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 and that will help with dementia. Um, but actually, it's the other forms of activity that are probably more important, social activity and also physical activity, because we are social creatures. We, we know that loneliness is toxic to our health. But what can happen before you know, people develop dementia and particularly after is they become socially isolated and that can become very, very toxic. I mean, we're a bit like meerkats. If you, you, know, if you get pushed away from the tribe, you, you quickly develop fleas and die. You know, we are social creatures. Um, and I think if people live sort of social lives, remain connected to the people that are important to them, you know, try to kind of keep their body moving and stave off things like frailty, then that's important. I think intellectual activity is the least important thing. And if I'm made to do Sudoku or crosswords in, in my nursing home when I develop dementia, I mean, I will hate that. Um, I, you know, and, and, and I've seen plenty of poor people being, you know, forced to do them because there's this assumption that that is somehow going to you know delay the the progression of dementia or prevent it yeah so i think there's a there's a as a society we've really got to think about this to make sure that we can maintain uh community groups um active activity groups um for our aging population we've got to invest in it we've got to invest in that because that's going to release the burden isn't it on the care at the care sector uh yeah i think that um Again, being connected to people is 
always important. I think, I mean, I lived in London for a good amount of time and, and, and I think it's a great city and people can be very connected, but people can be very disconnected as well. Mm. Um, I, I think in some towns, I did work in Godalming and also Cranley in Surrey and Cranley in particular was a small enough, I think it's actually a city, but a, you know, a big enough or small enough place that if people know people, so if someone's walking down the street and they know that that's, you know, John who has a bit of a memory problem, people will keep an eye out for him. Um, so he can maintain his citizenship. He can go to the shop and, and buy an apple. He can sort of bump into someone and have a chat. And if he sort of goes off the sort of, you know, the, the, the right path, people will keep an eye out for him. I mean, that's been the basis of our sort of civilization for years. And, and with dementia, it should be viewed no differently. Can you tell me about, um, you're obviously practising now in Western Australia in Perth, and, and what, what's the, is there a different approach or is there a different problem that, that, um, that, that Australia is facing with dementia or is it just the same as, as the UK? Uh, I think yes and no. I think that one, I mean, there's positives and negatives of both systems. I mean, that's often the case when you compare things side by side. Um, one thing that's very different um, is that here in Australia, dementia isn't really owned by one medical speciality. Um, so you could have your dementia or memory assessed by your GP, a neurologist, uh, a geriatrician, another physician or an old age psychiatrist. Whilst in the UK, I think it's a great thing that, that memory and, and dementia is owned by old age psychiatrists because we're specifically trained to consider the the impact of you know the body and the mind together mm. um, and certainly with memory clinics they were originally set up to really ring fence uh, memory drugs cognitive enhancers which were expensive at the time but what they've done is they've become places where people can go and seek advice about their memory um, and that pathway for memory diagnosis can be difficult in the best of times but at least in the uk there's it's a very established model now that's been going for two decades yeah yeah and is there much i don't know you you will you'll probably know i don't know what the difference in the demographic is in the you know i, I do know in the uk we've got this baby boom population now kind of maturing and, and moving into retirement and retirement age you know that ballooning is it the same in australia I think, I think largely, I think there's big differences between sort of the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal population here, which is a topic really in itself. But yeah. I think for the non-Aboriginal population, it's very, very similar to the UK. What's very unclear is what this cohort would be like as they age. You know, we, we, we all know about life expectancy, but what's actually more important is healthy life expectancy. And there's different schools of thought about what will happen as we age. Will, will we sort of stay well and, ha and, and healthy until a year or two before we die? Or will we develop a, a, a condition like dementia or another thing 10 or 20 years before we die and have to live with it? Now, the reality is actually both. And it, it places real challenges on sort of social policy makers in trying to you know, manage both sort of demand scenarios. For the individual, it's it's very tricky. One thing in the UK that, um, and the same in most Anglo-Saxon countries, is that we're used to health being free at the point of access, but social care is means tested. So this is the big challenge for um, people with dementia, I feel. It's not the absence of a cure, it's the fact that at a point where someone's diagnosed, they'll have to navigate the whole complexities of a means-tested social care system. And that's why one of the central tenets of the book is to think about these things earlier rather than later, because trying to navigate the health system, the social system during a crisis is very, very, very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about the book. What, how, did you, how did you come to write it? Well, as I was saying before, uh, Mary and I were conducting a memory clinic together in, in, in Surrey. Um, and, and as it happened, the regional hospital that we were working in really only had one room. So traditionally what might happen in other memory clinics is that you might go and see the psychiatrist or the doctor and, and you know, he does all the medical stuff about the memory and whatnot. And then you're asked to see someone from the outside in the society who will there sort of sit there and talk to you. But Mary and I had no choice but to sit together. So we really sat together and, 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 and really spoke about memory and dementia for a good number of years. And of course, between patients, we always compared perspectives. And that's where the, the book came about, as we suddenly thought that we should sort of maybe, you know, record some of this. And I must say that a lot of the wisdom came to us and not from us. Um, one, one of the joys of working with people 
and their carers with, with dementia is there's lots of sort of wisdom. Families um, develop really nuanced, very individual ways of dealing with a loved one with dementia and, and carers develop very creative ways and of, of managing very challenging problems. And also people with dementia, you know, the, some of the happiest people I've ever met. Um, so it's a real privilege to sort of meet that. And so the book aimed to really crystallise a lot of uh, our impressions and our thoughts about, about that work over about six years. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And so if we had to leave a nugget of wisdom, I suppose, to leave our listeners with one thought, a piece of advice on the topic of adventure, um, what would that be, do you think? I think don't be an ostrich. Don't don't put your head in the sand. Realise that a majority of us, as we get older, will be personally affected by dementia in some way. Either we will develop the condition ourselves or someone that we love will. So why not think about what that means now? Why not think about how we want our care to be, you know, are, are, do, are we happy to consider moving into a nursing home if, if uh, you know, there's certain risk issues at home like wandering or are we someone that, you know, wants to stay at home at all costs and accept that risk? Just have a conversation about memory and also just to think about these very, very big questions about what is memory and what's the self that, you know, we're not defined by our memories. And I used to tell people all the time that actually dementia doesn't take your personhood away from you. But of course, we don't really think about these very sort of abstract kind of concepts of how the self and uh, the memory interact. And I think if we had a discourse about mortality and dementia throughout our lives, we'd be much better equipped to deal with it later in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, from, from the conversations I've had, I understand that if you're, if you are suffering from dementia, being able to be in a familiar environment is very, um, very positive. And of course, that familiar environment, you could be a long way from family, you know, families are hugely dispersed, and I'm sure they are in Australia. But as you know, in the UK, people move away from hometowns, and, and they go to work and live in other places. And therefore, families are dispersed. And then, of course, if mum or dad or uncle and aunt start to suffer and you think oh well it'd be good if they were living closer to us or with us or what have you that can have a big impact can't it because of course then you are actually removing them from where they're comfortable uh, for possibly what you think is the best reason but also it, it it has a problem in itself yes yeah i mean nursing homes like the latter part of that word are also homes you wouldn't move to a home if you could help you know considering all the you know how you want your home to be the thing with nursing homes is they're very varied and and very different um it's a, probably a bit like choosing a school it's something that you need to kind of go and visit and get a gut sense um i mean there's you know the care quality commission you know will rate how good a home would be in the same way that there's those similar ratings for schools but you really want to sort of try and find a home of a size with the staff and management that suits you and i think if you avoid that process to the degree that you have to be placed in a home at the last minute that that rarely ends happily yeah yeah it's kind of choosing uh we often talk a little bit about people say to you know is there a way to to avoid losing our assets to pay for care and it's like well okay well actually if you want to let the council choose or the local authority choose where you spend the rest of your life then yes you can but if, if you want to have some kind of um impact on it yourself then naturally no you need to do some planning yeah, I mean, I, th I think the thing about dementia is it's not a cure crisis. Most distress for people with dementia doesn't come from the absence of some magic bullet. It comes, it's from a care crisis that really this question about whether as you get older, care should be free um, or heavily subsidised, as you see in some places like Japan, Denmark, and also to some extent Germany. Outside of those examples, you know, care has to be paid for and successive governments have avoided the issue because it is just too difficult. So it becomes a family issue rather than a state issue. And that's largely dependent on, on money as if so many things really. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really fascinating chatting to you and taking um, taking the time out of your uh, well your Anzac Day. Um, so uh, thank you very much for take, coming in on your day off. Before we go, could you let our listeners know how they can find out about, more about your book and your work and, and if, if they need to get in touch with you, how they could do? Yes, uh, the D word, Rethinking Dementia, is published by Hammersmith Books, which is a UK-based publisher, which you can Google. And if you wanted to contact Mary or myself, you could email us at 
the D word Collins Jordan at yahoo.com. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, um, I really appreciate say, I really appreciate your time. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much, Dr. Noel Collins. Thanks very much, too. Thank you once again to Dr. Noel Collins for joining me for this episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is brought to you by MFB Wealth Management. You can find the show notes for, for this episode, along with some useful links at the retirementcafe.co.uk, where you can also subscribe to never miss an episode. As always, if you'd like to let me know what you think about the points we discussed today, please email me at hello at the retirementcafe.co.uk and let me know what you think. Or to continue the retirement conversation, search for the Retirement Cafe on Facebook and leave some comments there. So until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk.